Hello and welcome to our second lecture on hemodynamics. With this lecture here we'll learn the normal ranges for cardiac output and perform a calculation as may be done in a clinical setting. Then we'll address the pitfalls and limitations of stroke volume calculations which will affect our cardiac output and many of the other volume and area derived values we may get in echo. So why do we like performing flow calculations? We'd like our sonographers to determine stroke volumes through the circulatory system or chambers of the heart. Uh, from stroke volumes, we can work out cardiac output. Calculation of regurgitant volumes and fractions through valves of the heart. We can also determine uh, the orifice areas of leaking valves. With the same formulas, we can work out the, the areas in a stenotic valve. And finally, we can calculate the intracardiac and extracardiac shunt ratios to determine if they're significant or not. In the previous lecture, we discussed the basics for stroke volume and cardiac output calculations. These are important as stroke volume, or effectively the left ventricular ejection fraction, may not provide an accurate picture of when determining heart failure. Consider when a patient has a low ejection fraction, but is in a tachycardic state. In this instance, we have a high heart rate and a low stroke volume, but the flow or Q could be relatively unchanged. Cardiac output at rest is typically about five liters per minute. In a fit young individual during exercise, we may see this increase up to 20 liters per minute. And in a supreme athlete, we may even see it move up to 35 liters per minute. As an estimate of cardiac output, it would effectively decreases by around about 5% for every 10 years between the ages of 20 and 70 years. So what does this all mean? How does a supreme athlete put out significantly more as a cardiac output compared to the average individual who would put out only 20 liters or less? It all comes down to knowing that the age predicted maximum heart rate is 220 minus our age. So we can't really influence that. It all comes down to how effective the heart muscle is actually squeezing and pushing the blood forward. So basically, they can put out more with each stroke volume, which means they have a greater cardiac reserve. Putting the stroke volume calculation into practice. Here we're assessing the proximal ascending aorta. We know the diameter is 33 millimeters. When we do our Doppler spectral trace, we got a VTI of 10 centimeters, and we know the patient's heart rate is 60 beats per minute. Working with our formula, cross-sectional area is 0.785 times 3.3 squared. So we've got to be careful here. We've converted 33 millimeters into centimeters. This gives us a cross-sectional area of 8.55 centimeters squared. It's then very simple to work out our stroke volume, which is cross-sectional area times VTI. So 8.55 times 10 works out to be 85.5 cc's or mils. It's then very simple to work out our cardiac output. So cardiac output is 85.5 times our heart rate of 60 beats per minute. And then we just need to adjust for mils being converted into liters, so we divide by 1,000. And doing so, we get a cardiac output of 5.1 liters per minute, well inside the normal range. When we do our stroke volume calculations, there are many assumptions, limitations, and considerations that we need to apply. Consider we're assessing aortic stenosis. We must be sure that the cross-sectional area for the aortic valve is measured when the period of flow is actually occurring. We also know that vessels of pulsatile can actually change in shape during the cardiac cycle. And this principle also applies for the valve as the annulus may deform to change in size or shape during the cardiac cycle. The VTI is determined by continuous wave Doppler with the most parallel alignment to the flow. And the VTI 
is made with the tracing of the flow profile around its leading edge. Heart rate is to be taken at the time of performing the above measurements. And in doing so, the assumptions that we have when uh, we determine the stroke volume this way is that the cross-sectional area remains constant during the period, that the cross-sectional area is circular in shape, and the sample volume remains unchanged in relation to the surrounding structures. But we know in all instances these don't always hold true. So what we need to do is minimise the impact that they may have and therefore the impact that it will have on our calculations. An individual VTI trace may be incorrectly performed, which leads to over or underestimation of the actual value. The patient may have sinus arrhythmia with slight beat-to-beat -beat variability. To minimise the effect of this, multiple VTIs for the one point of interest should be obtained. The average study should have three VTIs performed. And that's why it's appropriate to have your right sweep speed, in this instance it's 75 millimetres per second, to make sure we actually get three profiles on our Doppler spectral tracing. Should the patient actually be in atrial fibrillation or have persistent frequent ecotopic beats, then an even larger number of samples should be applied, maybe even up to eight. And this would obtain a much more accurate representation of what we need to do. It is impossible to take the VTI and the cross-sectional areas simultaneously, and the heart rate could actually vary between each point. And we can see that in this instance here. A VTI has been performed, and the patient had a heart rate of 76 beats per minute. But unfortunately, because the patient was in atrial fibrillation, when we actually did our LVOT diameter, we can see the heart rate is down at 52 beats per minute. And again, this raises the importance of actually doing averages to try and minimise the effects. Blood vessels are not rigid and valve annulus can actually change in shape during the periods of the cardiac cycle. Now another important feature is that the LV outflow tract and right ventricular outflow tract are actually a little bit more ovoid in that shape. This also applies to the mitral annulus, as we can see in the diagrams here. Here we've actually got an annular sewing ring that is applied to a mitral valve uh, when a repair is actually formed. So what we need to do is account for the slightly different shape that is not circular. And we can determine the new area by applying pi divided by 4, by x and by y where x is the long axis of the ellipse and y is the short axis of the shape. It is essential to obtain parallel alignment with the flow. Any angle where we're not extremely parallel with our flow introduces error and will lead to underestimation of the actual VTI. Additionally, the correct method for tracing the VCI must be used. For pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler, it is important to use the modal velocity when assessing flow within the vessel. This is the outer edge of the bright line obtained within the spectral trace. The bright edge demonstrates the majority of blood cells moving at the same velocity, and this is what we want to capture. Measuring the outer and less dense signals captures higher velocities but are only representative of a smaller amount of blood cells. This is used when assessing stenotic valves, where we trace the outer edge of the profile to obtain the largest and most representative VTI. Here we can see the sonographer has actually done a tracing of a VTI, but has done it inexpertly there. We can see we've started off tracing the modal velocity and then we actually start to moving the external edge and we even move away from the external edge in a few of the places there. So not a uh, optimal VTI. Machine settings are also important. If the gain is set too high or too low, the signal may be difficult to view and trace. And we can see that in that second set of views here. 
this would be very difficult to determine what the modal velocity was if that's what we wanted to actually trace. Additionally, filter settings are quite important, particularly when assessing low velocities. If the filter is too high, there is a large black band that appears on either side of the Doppler baseline. And this may actually obscure what the user actually needs to trace or makes it very difficult to actually bring the trace back down towards the baseline. <coughs> Errors can occur with the cross-sectional area measurement itself. The shizonographer should always apply a read zoom box over the area of interest to maximise the viewing space and improve accuracy with the placement of the measurement calipers. If measuring the LVOT with a heavily calcified aortic valve, it may be difficult to determine where to place the calipers, as in this instance here. Should it be placed here as the leaflet insertion point, or is it here? And then down posteriorly, is it here, here, or here, where we actually need to make our placements? The true diameter may not be obtained in the view and lead to underestimation of the actual cross-sectional area, or in some instances we can actually lead to an overestimation if we go way beyond where we need to be. An important thing to do is to actually scroll through your image backwards and forwards, and that way it may give you a better instance of where you actually need to place it, rather than just try and work on the still image alone. The user may also make the measurement in the wrong part of the cardiac cycle and thus obtain the incorrect diameter. And it's always important to measure at the timing of the flow, such as in mid-systole when measuring LVOT flow for aortic stenosis. If sample volume is placed in the LVOT, it may be too close to the valve and obtain flow acceleration, which is associated with flow convergence. Thus, the flow profile may be incorrectly obtained. You can imagine a raft moving along a river that approaches a waterfall, and as the raft gets close to where the waterfall actually is, the water starts to speed up. And exactly the same sort of is happening here, but on a much tighter scale. This brings up the conundrum that many sonographers actually query. Why do I measure my LVOT diameter at the leaflet insertion point, but actually measure away from the valve? Simply, this is to improve reproducibility and reduce interoperative variability. There are no landmarks to make placements of measurements when you move away from the leaflet insertion points, and thus the placement of calipers is relatively difficult. Additionally, velocities in the LVOT do not vary significantly in the small area unless you move too far away from the valve and actually start to move into the basal LV level. A sonographer measuring the mitral valve stroke volume must always place the pulse wave sample volume at the annulus level and not at the leaflet tips. And this is a common error that many junior sonographers actually make. Sample volumes may also move from the position, or the heart may move, and the zone for volume remains in the same place. Consider that the mitral valve annulus descends towards the apex in systole. So in systole, do we not only get a circumferential contraction that moves inwards, but we also have this longitudinal contraction where the base of the heart moves towards the apex. So our sample volume, if was placed here in systole, the heart has actually moved on and now we're actually in the left atrium. So in summary, we know that cardiac output is an easy and useful value. Consider that a small left ventricle must be hyperdynamic or at a high heart rate to achieve the same cardiac output as a large ventricle. Thus, it would be abnormal if a small LV cavity had an ejection fraction was towards the lower end of normal, or a patient had a dilated cardiomyopathy with a low ejection fraction might actually have a normal output. Or again, a patient with a low ejection fraction but in tachycardia might also have normal output. And we know that the stroke volume calculations have many potentials for pitfalls, whether they be in the cross-sectional area, the VTI, the technical ability of the sonographer and the machine settings actually applied.
And finally, we need to be aware that there are assumptions that are actually applied that are beyond our control, such as that uh, we believe that the cross-sectional area remains constant throughout the flow period, that the cross-sectional area is circular in shape, and that the sample volume remains unchanged during the period of flow.